The most important part about Sharp, or the Shore Update part, is this box here, over to you. And from this, you can edit the original record. Now, this is something that we were hearing about earlier. We, as archaeologists, make mistakes when we're doing surveys. We're throwing the data open to everybody. You can go in there, you can tell us where we've got grid coordinates wrong, or where we've misspelled names, or where we've misinterpreted sites. And the second part here, visit the site and do a Shore Update uh, so they can uh, prepare a pack as a PDF. And a pack as a PDF will include this very simple Shore Update field survey form with a series of multiple choice and tick box questions. But of course, because of its format, it means that the whole thing goes onto your mobile phone. You can download records in advance, so if you're in areas without any phone reception, you get the map tiles uh, and you get the site records so you can do the stuff even without phone reception. Within the phone, you can go in, you can edit the description, but more importantly, you can use your phone to take the photographs, you can use your phone to update the location using your phone's GPS, and there's a series of little tick boxes and check boxes and drop down lists on the app, and the most important part is this, recommendations. What action, if any, would you recommend for this site? So we are asking the public to look at those 12,500 records, many of which we have already prioritized which we as archaeologists think have the highest research potentials, but then saying, which ones do you think that we should be working on together? So, once the information comes in, I'll just rush through this, uh, we moderate it, so anything in a red box means that the original record has been changed, we moderate the records, we then put it up online, and so here we also stick up the photographs, here we have uh, the, the wrecks up in Lock Fleet, which I'm going to be very briefly talking about later. So, Sharp is a genuine exchange of information from communities to heritage managers. The important thing is we rely on the public. This isn't, this isn't anything else, this is we absolutely rely on people to send in information from these fun, flung and distant areas. And taking part in Shore, what, Shore Update helps people to understand and value their local heritage. And it can lead on to follow-on projects. But what have we learned from this? Well, firstly, the ideas and the techniques are constantly evolving. So although we had a very, very good idea when we set this up, and it took a year to set the whole project up, things have changed, and we feel that we ought to be sharing our experience so that other people don't reinvent the wheel. So I'm very pleased that Courtney is in here at the moment from the Citizen Project, which is going to be a similar thing which is going to be happening down in England. We've been talking to Courtney about this. Test the technology over and over again, and expect the development to take far longer than you think. I mean, we were sure that our app was going to work absolutely perfectly because we spent ages, you know, we've been making changes with the technology over the last year and it was inevitably going to cost you more than you think eventually. And also, however much information that you put on the web, so however much explanation we stick up in our explanatory videos and things, there is no substitute for actually getting out there and meeting people, getting out to the different places, having a session where you take people around, get them walking the coast, getting them using the technology or getting them filling in the forms, getting people's way in. That's the important thing. So, at 18 months, what have we got? Some numbers. 434 Shore Update surveys submitted and published, 168 new site records submitted, 1,183 site photographs, 580 volunteers, 39% of the audiences, 23% of young people. However, that is the numbers game. And often, funding bodies do require numbers of participants. But I do want to ask this, is counting people a good way to evaluate a project? Now, I know that if you work within a local authority or whatever, you have to count these numbers. But does it mean that people are actually having a good experience? And do we all count participants in the same way? I mean, for us, you have to be actively involved in order to get counted. You guys here sitting in this room will not count as any, as any number towards our project figures. And also, is the involvement of people over a sustained period of time more relevant than people who just show up once? I can have a hundred people who come and see me talk, I could be so horrible to them, they never ever get engaged in our again. And I could be actually doing the worst thing that I could imagine. Going back to those two things that I said before about gathering data doesn't protect sites and asking people to monitor things and, and let them be destroyed is bad. Going back to those, keep those in mind, this brings us on to sure dig. So this is the second phase, so people send in their recommendations and we want to move from this which is people zooming around the coast recording things, to this, which is people actually, actually actively involved in excavation. And in this photograph, there is one professional archaeologist, and everybody else is a member of the local community over on Valisha. Now, I'm now going over to, now I had actually made this like before Davey started talking about this. <laughs> so, professionals top down, communities bottom up, and lo and behold, 
the middle way. So exactly what David's talking about, and I put it in orange, or well, that should be orange, because this is actually Lord Buddha's, Lord Buddha's path to enlightenment, the middle way. So what we need is this mixture between professionals and communities. And here we see uh, Chris, here, in a room full of people over at IMAL, discussing what they would like to do over at IMAL Fort, bringing local communities together with professionals. Because I did have an idea of like, trying to make a slide of this super mega archaeologist mixture between Lara Croft and Indiana Jones and Mortimer Wheeler, who could do absolutely everything. But none of us are actually like this. Also, it was taking me too long to Photoshop, so I gave up. <laughs> Hold the picture in your mind, okay? <laughs> when you go on a dig, there are all sorts of specialists that we bring a team together. So just because you have a community archaeology dig, doesn't mean that you can't have a specialist in there as well. Okay, so. We've been trying to show the communities the different ranges of specialities that you can have. And I'm going to show you a very quick video. Now, in this video, what you need to be looking at is the different types of special, specialisms that people were talking about. But, because we have the Huta here, what you're actually going to be seeing is whether people manage to talk within their time or not. Okay. By modern intrusions. <coughs> Time up. <laughs> so what did we do? And this is the second last one. <laughs> there are key obstacles. But much of this you can get to. Thank you very much. Lastly, and finally, uh, this is a website address. Just like thanks so for listening, and I'll speak to you later. A deep soil here, a field. Yay! <laughs> Thanks for listening. Uh, please come along for a chat later. I'll be in room four. And we are able to reconstruct it. And then you're off. <laughs> okay, that's it. And we have the various and the horns and the gold and the pommel. And terrestrial scanning can do. We can do. And I have finished and I've beaten the clock. <laughs> Thank you. About his uh, drone. Thank you. And that was it. But I didn't get the future. Can I have a future anyway? Thank you very much. <laughs>
innovative ways of um, helping us to take photographs. So here is uh, Kirsty's aunt, uh, Kirsty McDonald's aunt, taking photographs using a camera fixed to the end of a fishing rod. Uh, and here, this is some human bone, which was mixed up with animal bone. This has been studied over at Bradford by uh, Ian Armit and his colleagues. Uh, and we've had Suricova, and they were doing OSL dating. So this is a proper community excavation involving the community. Pretty much they were directing what was going on, but we're also able to bring the specialists in to go and do some proper scientific work as well. The OSL dates here were very, very interesting. We found this half here. The OSL dates were telling us that this half is 9th century AD. Uh, all the pottery is telling us that this is mid Lion Age, and the C14 dates are telling us that 2nd century AD. And so now we're going through a program of TL dating that half as well, just to find out who's right. And of course, uh, these excavations give us the chance to, to uh, rescue the artifacts. All of this stuff, you have to remember, would be destroyed if we weren't actually doing the excavations. And it also enables us to involve the wider community as well. So here you have some artists who are depicting the archaeologists at work. Over in Crewster, uh, up in Shetland, we were working with Archaeology Scotland, and we're just about to start a new project uh, up in Muir, which is in Orkney. So there's Crewster and there's uh, Muir. A couple of burnt mounds, and this is the Crewster burnt mound, and the local community there, and also we were working with Ease Archaeology, I should say, on this one, uh, wanted to rebuild that at their local heritage centre. So here we have the community bringing their tractors over. They, we numbered up all the stones, we loaded them up, took them to the heritage centre, and we went from this to this in a matter of two months. But more importantly, the stone that we would used in order to actually do the reconstruction, to, to make a, a place for the reconstruction, we were able to build this replica. So we have a reconstruction and a replica, and in the replica we're using that for experimental archaeology. So, from all of this, I would say that we need to make true partnerships with communities. We as professionals need to go out there. But we need to involve the public in meaningful projects at places that they value. Rather than us going in and imposing our will on other people, we should, because there are enough sites, and if people find a place important, they'll come up and help us and work with us. And we need to provide local groups with continued support which means we need to make our support mechanism sustainable. Now this is the most important thing. With most of the projects that you've seen there, these have been going on for several years. They're not just single year projects. So we go back and more and more people get involved, more and more people, um, they, they tell their families, they tell other people, and, and it means that the projects become sustainable. What we should not be doing is raising expectations. We shouldn't be going in and promising the earth. We need to be realistic with what, and people will come in with suggestions. We need to keep everything level-headed. We really should not be abandoning groups after projects are finished or when the funding runs out. We should not be thinking that community archaeology is either easy or is a way to get free late labor. Community archaeology is difficult in order to do it properly. And we should not approach community archaeology as a trick for obtaining funding. So, that was a very, very quick run through. Thank you very much.